Let's join Dr. David Weissmiller for a discussion on Maternity Care One. First, we're going to focus on the antenatal piece. I have nothing to disclose during this presentation, and we'll look at the content and sequence of routine prenatal care, laboratory and imaging tests, and then diagnosing diabetes. Keep in mind, this is focused on questions on the three general portions of the exam. If you're going to take the maternity care module, there is additional material beyond my answer key slides, which I would review. And as well, if you're taking the module, I would get my hands on an advanced life support and obstetrics or an also manual and review that as well. Okay, you know what that is? That's a cabbage patch. That's where babies come from. That's me. No, it's not. Okay, here we go. Which one of the following is recommended for routine prenatal care? Serologic testing for HSV, parvovirus antibody testing, cystic fibrosis carrier screening, only at-risk women should be tested for HIV, or that all pregnant women should be screened for asymptomatic bacteria by urine culture. Good, good, good. Oh, excellent. We're off to a very good start. E is the correct answer. Everybody should be screened for asymptomatic bacteria by culture. Okay, here are the lab tests that we do. These have not changed in a long time. A blood group in RH, an antibody screen, screening for anemia with an H and H, a rubella antibody titer, a syphilis screen. If you're at high risk, you should be screened three times during the pregnancy, a hepatitis B virus surface antigen, cervical cytology as needed, meaning that if you have been in the recommended window for screening, pregnancy is not an indication for cytologic evaluation. So currently, if you're under the age of 30, it's every three years. If you've had it within three years, you would get, not get another one during pregnancy. STI, GC and chlamydia in particular, a urine culture between 11 and 16 weeks screening for asymptomatic bacteria, sickle cell screen if you meet one of the typical ethnic backgrounds of descent. We'll talk about HIV screenings, varicella screening, CF screening, and then gestational diabetes screening. Keeping in mind if you are at high risk, you may want to screen these patients for pre-existing diabetes at intake, if that is negative, then everybody gets routinely screened at 24 to 28 weeks. If we look at anemia, this is the current ACOG practice bulletin that iron supplementation does decrease the prevalence of anemia at delivery. Why do we worry about iron deficiency anemia? Because it's associated with things such as low birth weight, preterm delivery, perinatal mortality. Now, how do we define iron deficiency anemia? It's based on the trimester, less than 11, 10.5, or 10, respectfully, in the first, third, second, and third trimesters. Keep in mind the USPSTF has found insufficient evidence to recommend for or against routine iron supplementation. In terms of STI screening during pregnancy, everybody gets screened for hepatitis B, HIV, and syphilis. Chlamydia and gonorrhea, if you're less than 25 years of age and engaging in high-risk sexual behaviors. They do not recommend routine screening for chlamydia in pregnant women not at increased risk. There's no recommendation made about screening for gonorrhea in pregnant women not at increased risk. So the two high-risk groups for chlamydia and gonorrhea are less than 25 or engaging in high-risk sexual behaviors. Now, how do we define high-risk sexual activity? Younger patients, but particular multiple sexual partners, no barrier conception or contraception, no barrier contraception, they're incarcerated or illegal drug use. It's recommended against routine screening of low-risk women. Okay, asymptomatic bacteria, how do we define this? It's greater than 100,000 CFU per mil of a bacterial species. E. coli is most common. Keep in mind that a greater than 100,000 of lactobacillus or staph, unless it's staph saprophyticus, is a contaminant. This came up on Monday in our clinic. The resident came to me and said, um, I don't need to treat this because it's staph. And I said, well, you don't need to treat it unless it's staph saprophyticus. Mmm, I wonder if it's that. We pulled up the result, then it was staph saprophyticus, so it does get treated. Now, pregnancy does not increase your risk for asymptomatic bacteria. It's present in about 2 to 7% of pregnant women. We culture them at the first prenatal visit. 
If it is negative, there's no reason to reculture them for asymptomatic bacteria. The risk of developing it is almost zero. Now, if they develop symptoms, that's a whole different issue. The only exception is those with sickle cell trait. Because of a renal papilla issue, anatomically, they're at increased risk, and therefore, they should be screened each trimester. The issue with asymptomatic bacteria is that it, it predisposes you to pyelo, which predisposes you to preterm labor. So that's why we're screening everyone. Now, which of the following antibiotics should be used in the empiric treatment? AMP, Clinda, Cephalexin, or Avalox? Okay. Well, we have a learning opportunity again. So the correct answer is Cephalexin. The correct answer is Cephalexin. Seven-day course. Single-dose regimens have not been widely studied. Very high resistance to ampicillin. After you have treated them, the urine culture should be done to ensure that you've eradicated it. If you have not, those patients could be considered for suppressive therapy. Here are the antibiotics considered safe in pregnancy and those which we typically avoid, definitely tetracyclines, sulfonamides and nitrofurantoin in the first trimester only when no other suitable alternative antibiotic is available. There's a continued kind of static in the literature about nitrofurantoin and sulfonamides. Here's the treatment of asymptomatic bacteria. The number needed to treat is 20. I got to treat 20 people with asymptomatic bacteria to prevent one preterm delivery. Herpes, everybody gets asked, underline asked about a history. Here's the rates of vertical transmission at delivery. Look at this. If you have recurrent genital herpes, even if you had a vaginal delivery, the risk of transmission is 0 to 3%, very low. So we do all those sections to prevent that. Genital herpes acquired during pregnancy, we don't appear to have an increased rate of neonatal illness or congenital HSV as long as you have completely seroconverted, IgM to IgG, prior to the time that labor begins. Here is the issue with suppressive therapy. If you have an outbreak of herpes during the pregnancy, you should be treated and then offered at 36 weeks or beyond suppressive therapy. By placing people on suppressive therapy, you can see the rate of C-sections for recurrent genital herpes is decreased by 40%. The drugs of choice are either acyclovir or valacyclovir. HIV testing, everybody gets it, first and third trimester. It is a routine part of the laboratory panel, and the patient can opt out of having it done. If they opt out twice, they get rapid testing in labor. If, of course, they come back positive, you would not wait for a confirmatory test. You would initiate antiretroviral prophylaxis. If, she, if the mother does not consent in either the first or third trimester and refuses rapid testing, then the baby is tested. Evidence of immunity to varicella. Although you are seeing an emergence of people getting serology, the recommendation from the CDC is still to do the history through, or is still to screen through history. If they're negative or unsure, then you get a titer because of women of childbearing age who say, hmm, I've never had chicken pox. 90% of them will be seropositive, i.e. they will have had a subclinical infection. Where this most often comes up is, do they need to get V-Zig or not? Before you give V-Zig, you should do the titer since 90% of them are going to be seropositive. Cystic fibrosis recommendations. Uh, this is a new statement from ACOG back in 2005 now, but basically they're saying information about CF to all couples. It used to be broken out based on ethnic background, but all couples should be offered information based on CF screening. It should be done before conception or in early pregnancy if both partners um, are Caucasian, European, or Ashkenazi Jew. So the screening should be offered before conception as opposed to just offering information. No routine screening for hepatitis C, HPV, or parvovirus B19. The only thing I want to say about parvovirus B19 is to remind you that it is embryotoxic, not teratogenic. The fetus is at greatest risk three to six weeks after maternal infection. 
i.e. this is a new infection and they're IgM positive. Fetal monitoring is typically done with a weekly ultrasound and cerebral artery dopplers because of concern about high drops and anemia. Per ACOG 2013, at 24 weeks gestation, you perform a one-hour glucola test, which is elevated at 166. You would next repeat the one-hour glucola in one week, have the patient see the dietitian for diabetic diet information, order a three-hour glucose tolerance test, or start low-dose metformin. What are you going to do? Fantastic. 80% of you got that correct. It is answer C. Okay, well, here is the study uh, folder summary slide. So ACOG last year said use a two-step method at 24 to 28 weeks. The blood glucose level of either 135 or 140 at the one-hour determination could be used. They also recommend screening for undiagnosed type 2 diabetes at the first prenatal visit in those women who are at risk. USPSTF on January 14th of this year issued a new statement that said screen asymptomatic women after 24 weeks. They said the current evidence was insufficient to screen before 24 weeks, essentially for undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. The ADA changed their statement between 2013 and 2014. Last year, they had been arguing to use a two-hour glucose tolerance test. They have now going back, gone back to using the two-step method with a 50-gram load followed by a diagnostic test. What they're saying is a one-step method would be skipping the screening and just going for the three-hour diagnostic test. Now, if we look at screening for undiagnosed type 2 diabetes at that first prenatal visit, how could we do that? We could use a hemoglobin A1C, a fasting plasma glucose. You could use a one-step method or a two-step method. Okay, this is screening for, for pre-existing diabetes. You could also do a random plasma glucose over 200. So this is screening for undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. Now, who would we want to screen for undiagnosed type 2 diabetes using any of those methods? These would be the people. Okay, I will tell you, this defines my OB population in eastern North Carolina. If you, made a, if you took our 39 counties in eastern North Carolina and made us a state, we would have the largest people in the country. My largest BMI to date, 114. 114. Marked obesity, personal history of gestational diabetes or a large for gestational age infant, glycosuria, diagnosis of PCOS, strong family history, or a ethnic background which puts them at risk, which essentially is anybody who's native to this nation except for Caucasian. If there's a negative screening test for overt type 2 diabetes, they get retested for gestational diabetes at 24 to 28 weeks. The initial screening is done with a 50-gram oral glucose load, 135 or 140 is your cutoff. Note that on the screening test, if it's over 190, you don't need to do a diagnostic test. It's going to be abnormal. You then go on to a three-hour glucose tolerance test, overnight fast, 100-gram glucose polymer, and then you do a fasting one-hour, two-hour, three-hour blood sugar. If two of the four values are exceeded, 95, 180, 155, 140, you have gestational diabetes. So you can see, you could just say, I think they're gonna have it, and skip the screening test and go right for the diagnostic test. Undiagnosed type two diabetes, ACOG says you would wanna consider screening those with a prior history of gestational diabetes, known impaired glucose metabolism, or obesity. So you can see the factors differ between ADA just a bit and ACOG. Don't even ask me who they're going to ask you about. I have no idea. So I, you're going, they're going to have to tell you, per the American Diabetes Association, who would be screened for type 2 diabetes early in the pregnancy. Per ACOG, who would be screened for type 2 diabetes early in the pregnancy. I don't think they would ask that, though. Okay. Now, gestational diabetes is increasing. Why is that? Obesity? Older age of pregnancy? What we also see in these women is an increased risk for gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, cesarean, and a sevenfold increased risk of developing diabetes later in life. Okay, what about screening later in pregnancy? Open neural tube defects, aneuploidy, sonography, anemia, and group B strep.
So if we look at the summary for screening for open neural tube defects and aneuploidy, we use a maternal serum alpha fetoprotein. This is an analyte in the mother's blood. If it's high, they, they have an increased risk of an open neural tube defect. If it's low, then paired with three other analytes from mom's blood, HCG, estriol, dimeric inhibin A, that indicates potentially trisomy 21. Low levels of all four analytes, the risk is trisomy 18. Please make a note, the most common reason for a false positive is an incorrect assignment of estimated gestational age, because you are given a calculated risk for open neural tube defect and for aneuploidy. And if you've provided the laboratory with the wrong gestational age, they could give you an incorrect assignment of risk. Here are the detection rates of the various screenings that are available. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that we now have available first trimester screening and an integrated first and second trimester screening. The problem is first trimester screening and integrated screening, we do not have resources nationally yet to support that in every hospital. So the standard still remains the quadruple screening in the second trimester. Okay, according to the CDC, all women of childbearing age should consume how much folic acid on a daily basis? Four milligrams, 0.4 milligrams, one milligram, or 0.8 milligrams. What's the CDC say about consumption of folic acid on a daily basis? All women of childbearing age. Okay, oh gosh, you love that rainbow. Look at that. We have a learning opportunity again. So the correct answer is actually B, B. And this is a relatively new statement published in 1992. <laughs> All women of childbearing age should be on uh, 0.4 milligrams per day. It's estimated to reduce the risk of neural tube defects by up to 80%. Now, keep in mind that this reduction in, open neural, tu in neural tube defects is associated with synthetic folate. A diet rich in naturally occurring folic acid has not been shown to accomplish the same task. Now, we supplement all grains in this country with synthetic folate. However, based on the typical consumption by the typical American woman in the United States, she only gets about 240 micrograms in her diet of synthetic folate. And that's why the recommendation is to still be on a multivitamin with 400 micrograms per day. Keeping in mind that 50% of pregnancies are unintended in this country. And of that 50%, 50% of the women are using some form of birth control, albeit not very effectively. History of neural tube defect, four milligrams per day, at least a month before conception, continuing through the first three months of the pregnancy. I do want to note that the Institute of Medicine does provide slightly varying guidelines on folic acid supplementation. Most people go with the CDC. Now, one issue about folic acid with epilepsy. If you're on valproate or carbamazepine, you get put on four milligrams per day. You treat them as if they've had a prior neural tube defect. All the other anti-epileptic drugs, the recommendation is 800 micrograms at least one to three months prior to conception. The issue here is that the low serum folate levels in women with, in, with epilepsy are independently associated with an increased risk of major fetal malformations. We do not know if providing them with the um, increased dose of synthetic folate is able to completely overcome and prevent neural tube defects in women who are receiving anti-epileptic drugs. Okay, according to ACOG, which of the following statements best characterizes the use of sonography in pregnancy? It has the ability to diagnose minor fetal anomalies. It is best carried out at 12 weeks estimated gestational age. It's an accurate method of determining placental location. Routine use is recommended. Okay, so excellent. C is the correct answer. Accurate method of determining placental location. Now, how do we define a screening sonogram? Very specifically here, we're looking at a anatomic survey of the abdomen between 16 and 20 weeks in the absence of specific indications for a second trimester ultrasound. Now, what are we looking for as we do the ultrasound? How many are in there? What's the location of the placenta? Biometric analysis to determine the gestational age. If they're beyond 20 weeks, an assessment of the amniotic fluid volume, et cetera. 
Now, here's the summary from ACOG on the American College of Radiology and the American Institute of Ultrasonographic Medicine in terms of ultrasound and pregnancy. What I want to point out you, your um, information to is the third bullet. Specific indications are the best basis for use. And if you're going to do it in the absence of specific indications, 18 to 20 weeks is optimal timing. 18-year-old G1P0 at 40 and 5 sevenths weeks. She says she thinks her water broke two days ago. An exam confirms rupture of membranes. The patient is afebrile with a non-tender uterus. The fetal heart rate tracing is reassuring. A GBS culture obtained four weeks ago was negative. The patient has no known drug allergies. In addition to induction of labor, which one of the following is the most appropriate management for this patient? A, no antibiotic prophylaxis. B, AMP. C, Clinda. D, Vank. Okay, so we have a learning opportunity, and the correct answer is A. The correct answer is A. So here we go with GBS. Universal screening is recommended. There are two groups of women who do not get screened at 35 to 37 weeks. That is, I've had a prior child affected with early onset GBS sepsis, or any urine culture that was done during this pregnancy had GBS in it. One unit, a million units. Any urine culture for any reason had any GBS. We swab the lower vagina if they don't meet those criteria. We order susceptibility testing on the isolates, particularly if they are pen allergic. If you have a negative GBS culture within five weeks of delivery, and ours was four weeks, you do not require antibiotics even if risk factors develop. So she was GBS negative, but she developed a risk factor. She does not cross over into risk factors if she was GBS negative. Okay? So that was the issue there. Now, I want to draw your attention to this particular CDC 2010 algorithm. And I want you to note there that if you're allergic to penicillin, with the history of any of the following anaphylaxis, angioedema, respiratory distress, urticaria, that's where the susceptibility isolates will be important. Because if it's susceptible to clinda or erythro, you use that. If you don't know the susceptibility, and you're penallergic, and you had a severe reaction, you gotta get vank. Now, keep in mind, though, that if you're penallergic, and you have only a minor issue, rash, something like that, then you do get a cephalosporin, cefazolin, okay? So it's only with the major issue you go to clinda or erythro. If it's a minor issue in terms of an allergy, then you go to cefazolin, okay? But please understand that, because I know the question they're going to ask you on the board is they're going to get you to vancomycin, okay? They're going to get you to have to go to vancomycin. Always they go all the way down, okay? 26-year-old female comes in with lower abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding. Last period was seven weeks ago. Urine pregnancy test is positive, and a quant beta HCG level is 2,500. Transvaginal sonography shows no evidence of an intrauterine gestational sac. The baseline laboratory tests are basically all normal. She gets a single dose of methotrexate. Four days later, she presents for reevaluation, and her quant beta HCG is found to be 3,800. Seven days later, it's found to be 4,400. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step? A repeat dose of methotrexate, repeat transvaginal sonography, laparoscopy, expectant management. Hello. Okay, so we have a learning opportunity here, and the correct answer is A. A. Okay, so let's take a look at ectopic pregnancy. When you include maternal deaths in the first trimester, ectopic pregnancy and thromboembolic disease vie for, vie for number one is the most common cause. When you remove the first trimester, venous thromboembolic event is the number one cause of maternal death. Previous ectopic in utero DES exposure, most strongly associated factors. Increased risk, genital infections, smoking, Early diagnosis is very important. Pregnancy outcomes with methotrexate comparable to those with surgery. How do we diagnose it? The biggest issue is the ultrasound. Now, keep in mind that if you have an ectopic, you typically present with pain and then bleeding. 
Spontaneous loss, you tend to have bleeding and then pain. Ectopic tends to occur at seven to eight weeks. Spontaneous loss tends to occur more at 10 to 11 weeks. Here are the numbers you need to remember. If you have a beta HCG over 3,500, on your trans abdominal ultrasound, you should see a gestational sac. If you have a beta HCG over 1,800, you should see a gestational sac on a transvaginal ultrasound. So on the exam, if you tell you, tell you the beta HCG is 900 on a transvaginal, you shouldn't see anything. There, you would repeat an ultrasound, or you would repeat the ultrasound once the beta HCG was over 1,800. So 3,500 and 1,800 are important numbers to know. Keep in mind that with a normal pregnancy, the um, beta HCG will double about every 48 hours, but you cannot differentiate ectopic and IUP from that. Chorionic villi, that is a diagnostic curatage. If they are not detected, you should be thinking ectopic, but you would only do a diagnostic curatage when the beta HCG levels are falling or they're elevated and the ultrasound doesn't show an intrauterine pregnancy. So how can we use the villi being absent on DNC? You gotta be thinking if they're absent, I've got an ectopic. Decreasing HCG, you just follow the titers down. Rising or stable HCG, and you got a large mass, they go to surgery. Rising or stable HCG, no villi, i.e. it's got to be outside the uterus someplace, smaller mass, they can get medical treatment. Serum progesterone levels, the take-home message is bullet three. If I include it in an algorithm to try to diagnose ectopic, I miss more ectopic than I find. I miss more than I find, so not helpful. Hemodynamically unstable, laparotomy. Early diagnosis and the patient is stable, they can get a laparoscopic salpingostomy or medical treatment with methotrexate. Multiple doses of methotrexate are actually more effective than surgery. Single dose has a higher failure rate than laparoscopic salpingostomy. Here are the absolute contraindications to getting methotrexate. Breastfeeding, pulmonary disease, hepatic renal hematologic dysfunction. I don't think you really need to know those, but they're there. Here's how we do it. You measure HCG on days four and seven. If the difference is greater than 15% fall, you repeat weekly until it's undetectable. If it's less or it's going up, those are the patients who will need a repeat dose and you start a new day one. Single dose methotrexate easier, but contraindications are a larger ectopic pregnancy. Here's the summary in terms of diagnosing an, a, an ectopic. IUP rules it out. No gestational sac and a beta HCG over 1800 on a transvaginal ultrasound, highly suggestive. Pitfalls, you can find a pseudogestational sac or a ruptured corpus luteum. The gold standard for diagnosis is laparoscopy. Expected management can be done if you have minimal pain or bleeding, reliable follow-up, no tubal rupture, a beta HCG uh, preferably less than 1,000 and falling, a smaller adnexal mass, no embryonic heartbeat. First trimester bleeding, the other common cause we see is spontaneous pregnancy loss. Keep in mind, chromosomal abnormalities are the cause in about 50%. No bed rest, drug therapy, including progestins, are going to correct the common etiologies. It is already sealed once the bleeding has started. The, cri the criteria for diagnosing an early pregnancy failure have been recently published by the Society of Radiologists in Ultrasound. A definitive pregnancy failure can be diagnosed with an intrauterine pregnancy of uncertain viability when the transvaginal ultrasound reveals any of these four following attributes. I would put that in my study folder to review. And lastly, an indication for the administration of anti-D immune globulin Rogram to an unsensitized D-negative patient is routinely at 16 to 20 weeks, an induced abortion, delivery of a D-negative infant, amniocentesis only when the placenta is traversed. Okay, so the correct answer is B. The correct answer is B. So here is who gets it. I'm unsensitized and I have a gesta an ectopic gestation. Any form of termination, spontaneous, induced. If I have a procedure where there could be a fetal maternal bleeding, CVS, amnio, doesn't matter if you traverse the placenta. Condition associated with a fetal maternal hemorrhage, trauma, external cephalic version, routinely at 28 weeks, 
And then if I deliver a D positive baby, if mom's negative and she delivers a D negative baby, she does not get repeat Rogam, okay? Okay, those are our answers, and we are done with part one. Thank you very much.